All right, everybody. Welcome to Standing for Truth. I am your host, Donnie. And today we have a very exciting debate for everybody. Tonight we've got the much anticipated debate between Michael, the Canadian atheist, and Dr. Kenny Rhodes, the God debate. Christian God or no God? Now, anybody who's not yet subscribed, please hit that subscribe button as we do host interviews, debates, discussions, lectures, and more. So please make sure to hit that subscribe button. Now, before I um, introduce the debaters and kind of get to know each other a little bit, I do want to go over a couple uh, couple reminders for everybody. We've got some epic debates uh, in the future. Uh, even during the remainder of September, uh, the 26th, we've got Did God Command the Slaughter of the Canaanites, C.J. Cox and Dr. Randall Rouser. We've also got uh, C.J. back again for our main event on September 30th, the big end times theology debate, pre-tribulation rapture versus post-tribulation rapture, C.J. Cox versus Kent Hoven. We've also got a couple epic uh, Trinity debates uh, next month. As well, Matt Slick will be back here. He'll be debating Taylor Stewart. This will be closer to the end of the month. But on the 12th, we've got uh, the big debate is the Trinity Biblical. Matt Slick taking on Dr. Shabir Ali. So that being said, guys, check the event section on our official webpage or just go to the upcoming live stream section uh, on the main YouTube channel for all your uh, reminders. I just set uh, four or five events uh, today, actually. So definitely check that out. Anyways, you guys came to see the debaters, Michael and uh, Dr. Rhodes. So gentlemen, thank you so much for uh, giving us your time for this important debate. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, glad to be here. I'm glad to be anywhere, actually, right where I'm at these days. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're happy to have you, Kenny. And Michael, uh, you both are seasoned debaters. Mike, you've been here numerous times in the past. Uh, Dr. Rhodes, you've been here numerous times as well. So this is sure to be a debate to remember. Debate or discussion. It's going to be kind of more of an informal discussion, actually. So why don't we get to know you guys a little bit? Uh, why don't we start with Michael? A little bit about you, a little bit about your podcast, and just kind of tell us how you've been. Well, this is usually where you tell everybody about me, and then I sit there and just repeat everything you just said. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, hey, you can go uh, that route. everybody, I'm, I'm Michael. Uh, I'm half of the Canadian Atheist podcast I do with my good friend, Dean. Uh, and we like to talk to uh, believers and cover uh, news stories, things that uh, religious people do and say, and uh, have conversations. And that's, that's pretty much that. Awesome. I appreciate that. Uh, Mike and Kenny, thanks for being here. Uh, brother, how you been? And, uh, you know, what's going on over at your channel? Well, um, I had hoped to put up some more content, but um, uh, and I'll just uh, make this statement public because I'm going to ask for prayer as well. Uh, I, I've been uh, basically found out that some of the medications I had been taking uh, were uh, really bad for my body. So I am attempting to titrate off of a couple medications and um, was never told that they were literally physiologically addictive. And so I've just gone through uh, hell, really, the last month or so, um, because I'm also trying to aggressively get off this stuff. So uh, anyway, uh, that's what's been going on. I was off and on thinking, you know, do I do I... Uh, keep the appointment to have this discussion or do I, uh, you know, s postpone it uh, just because I've been so up and down and, you know, have times where it makes me feel depressed. And so anyway, uh, I decided I would respect everybody's time and just kind of trust that the Lord would carry me through. Um, so anyway, uh, that's what's been going on. And I will uh, just up there well kenny we appreciate you uh being here tonight you are in in my prayers in in uh the prayers of uh everybody in the in the audience so we we, we pray for a, a speedy recovery and uh you know we admire your strength 
for um, for being here tonight. So I appreciate that. I appreciate uh, you as well, Michael, for giving us your time for tonight. Um, I should say this is not an excuse if I perform uh, horrible tonight. So just want to say (laughs) (laughs) no worries. No worries. We know that. Um, So just to go over the format for tonight, um, guys, we are going to be it's going to be kind of informal, but we're still going to have 12 minute opening statements. Uh, We're going to have Michael. He's going to start us off with his 12 minute opening statement. Then we're going to hand it to Kenny. Kenny can take up to 12 minutes. Whatever he doesn't use, we can throw into the discussion portion because then we're going to jump right into a free flowing organic dialogue where the debaters, Kenny and Michael can uh, ask each other questions about the, about the topic. That being said, we will be having the audience uh, involved as well. So please, as the discussion's taking place, tag me at Standing for Truth with your questions, and uh, we'll have a solid, uh, a really fun audience Q&A. So that being said, uh, let's hand it right to you, uh, Michael, uh, for your 12-minute opening statement. Whenever you're ready, you can just let me know, and, and I'll get the timer going. Cool. Uh, first thing I'd like to say is, uh, Kenny, feel better. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm ready anytime. So here we go. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in. Donnie, thanks for having the stones to bring me back on for a fourth time. It's always a pleasure to be here. Hello, chat. Toss uh, Donnie some super chat love and get your questions in there, but please ask Kenny some questions too. I want to thank Kenny for uh, wanting to chat with a filthy heathen like me. I've watched a few of his discussions now, and I like that he hates debates too. I like talking to people, and I've come to believe that debates are far too adversarial to really make any headway, so let's just chat. Quote, I contend we are both atheists. I just believe in one fewer God than you do. When you understand why you dismiss all the other gods, you'll understand why I dismiss yours. Professor Richard Dawkins. Tonight, we're meant to be discussing the Christian God versus no God. I'm looking forward to this for a few reasons. First is, I love chats like this. Second, I think it's wise not to lock yourself into an echo chamber of similar views, but instead, get out there and have yourself challenged. Lastly, I'm so glad that Kenny agreed to defend what he actually believes. He's a Christian, and I'm glad he'll be sticking up for that particular point of view. All too often, especially of late and as recently as last night, I see and hear wannabe apologists and professing believers arguing from vague town, and it pisses me off. Your Bible, 1 Peter 3.15, calls you to be ready to defend your faith. Do that. Have the courage of your convictions, or maybe stay home. I'm genuinely curious to speak with Kenny at length tonight. I can't wait to hear his evidence. Because of the agreed-upon topic, I know we won't just hear philosophy. Now, to be clear, I'm not knocking philosophy, but it certainly isn't evidence for the Christian God. And I know Kenny won't just use all the traditional arguments either, like Kalam, which is a a terrible argument, Uh, uh, ontology, teleology, fine-tuning. These arguments don't fly. None of them can work. Now, while you sit there viciously typing into the chat or screaming at your monitor or phone, Hear me out. What are we discussing? We're discussing the Christian God. All the above listed arguments are general. The very best they can do is get you to deism. Worse than that, they've all been used to argue the existence of Allah and Brahman. And even more, each of these arguments could be used to argue for Osiris or Poseidon. Each and every apologist, regardless of their faith position, is convinced they show their God, just like Christians. William Lane Craig, for example, He's convinced they demonstrate the truth of Yahweh. Yet Arun Yahya is convinced they show Allah is true. Because all of those arguments can be used to defend any faith tradition, they cannot be used to argue for anyone in particular, and this includes Yahweh. To argue that they're evidence for your God, but not others, is very much like, if not exactly, special pleading. And I know Kenny will want to steer clear of fallacious argumentation. Will we hear naturalistic theology? Maybe. Uh, for anyone unfamiliar, it contains things like, and, and I'm no expert when it comes to this. I've only read a little bit. Things like the one ground, the many. Well, okay, cool. But now it falls on Kenny to show how this one thing isn't just an unknown natural cause. Yes. Anything you can explain with a supernatural explanation, you can also use a natural one. Well, he offer something like, well, with the Christian God, we find all the answers to so many of our biggest questions. Well, sure you do. Just like every other faith tradition. Will he argue a la Habermas and simply try to use minimal facts? I hope not, because the assumption you need to make those fly is far from realistic. Well, what are we left with? 
we're left with your source book, the Bible. And to be clear, this isn't just an issue for Christians. It would be true if I was debating a Muslim or Hindu or a follower of Ra, the Egyptian sun god. We'd just be using different holy books. I'm an atheist, and while not wholly responsible for making or keeping me that way, the Bible never disappoints when it comes to showing the stories inside it are just that, stories. I'm not saying there's no historical significance to any of it. I'm speaking of the supernatural stuff. That stuff for sure we know never happened. And when I say for sure here, I'm speaking from the standpoint of the philosophical principle of fallibilism, which states we can have knowledge without having absolute certainty. From everything we know about the universe, Earth and how they work, there are just too many things that are wrong or outright impossible for the Bible to be taken seriously. Christians hold the Bible to be the inspired word of God. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, and this is paraphrased, all scriptures God breathed and suitable for teaching. And it has to be true, right? Revelation 22.18 says, and again paraphrased, anyone who adds anything to it or takes anything away is in big trouble. So let's look at a few Bible stories. Jonah. Are we expected to believe that digest the digestive system of a great fish just failed to function? Joshua. Are we expected to believe that physics stopped working and the sun stood still? Daniel. Are we expected to believe that flesh failed to be burned by fire? Job. Are we expected to believe that fire fell from heaven, consuming sheep and servants? Fire. Falling from the sky. Mark 13. Are we expected to believe that stars will fall from the sky? Now, this one's funny. I've heard it argued that Jesus meant angels, but the text says stars would fall from the sky. And then later on, Jesus said that he would send his angels to collect his elect. The main issue here is if, if you write these off as allegory or metaphor, you've dug a huge hole for yourself. Now you need to be able to demonstrate how you determine what was metaphorical versus what was literal. For example, maybe a local flood versus a global one. Or things like people yelling and blowing horns at walls and made them fall over. Or a dead Jewish rabbi coming back to life. Because that has to be true. Or you don't have Christianity. Another favorite of mine is 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 14.33. Again, paraphrased. God is not the author of confusion. Is that to be taken seriously? Sorry, that was rhetorical. A new favorite pastime of mine is going to Christian YouTube channels and podcasts and listen to them argue. OSAS versus conditional salvation. YEC versus OEC, oneness versus the Trinity, six-day creation versus theistic evolution. Hell, many Christians can't even agree on a mode of baptism, full body aversion versus sprinkling. Debates on soteriology and eschatology. How do we get saved and what happens at the end? Are we annihilated? Is there a period of strife or eternal suffering and damnation? Do I need to be NIFB, Anglican, Methodist, Presbyterian, Calvinist, or Catholic? I think we can all agree that Mormons are totally out to lunch though, right? Now go convince them of that. Each side on each topic has convinced the other is either simply mistaken. Well, what is my each phone doing? Hang on. Wow, my phone just started up there for some reason. That's crazy. Sorry about that. Um, now, brothers and sisters in Christ will simply laugh these off or write these off as internal disagreements among brethren or simply employ the iron sharpens iron apologetic while arguing. Well, this doesn't fly. Not when you have conv conflicting doctrine from in some cases conflicting Bibles or texts, different translations and interpretations, and many with mutually exclusive points, and not insignificant ones. Do I need to put up with the these and thous and be a KJV only guy? Or can I side with Matt Slick, who uses the NASB? On Apologetics Live, he stated, quote, the NASB is a very good translation, end quote. Really, no confusion, huh? Here's another funny one. I've heard Christians go on and on about the clear evidence for design, and many base it on what the Bible says. For example, the overwhelming complexity of life, like with us humans. Yet what does the Bible say? Genesis 2.7, then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. And Genesis 2.21 says the woman was formed from his rib. I've also heard people like Ken Hoven argue on this channel, mockingly suggest like, quote, you don't think a bunch of animals could fit on a boat, but you think everything in the universe fit into a single dot smaller than a period on a page, end quote. Yet, it's Christians like William Lane Craig who, uh, who said, when asked by Christopher Hitchens in his debate with him at Biola University, quote, was there pre-existing material for God to work with, or did he simply will it into existence ex nihilo, end quote. Craig responded with, quote, no, there was no pre-existent material, end quote. So I would respectfully ask believers to please stop saying we're the ones who think the universe and everything came from nothing, or go email Craig. Tell him he was wrong. I'd love to hear that exchange. Funnier still is the assertion from people like Hoban that say evolution teaches we came from rocks. Quote, evolution teaches that there were rocks. It teaches that it rained on the rocks for millions of years. 
then somehow the runner from the rocks came alive. That is what you believe, end quote. No, not one science textbook anywhere teaches that. Yet Kent believes, quote, the Bible is literally true and scientifically accurate, end quote. So it would be he that would hold a Genesis 2 where it says man came from dust and woman from a rib. I could go on all day about the silly things the Bible say, like a flood we know never happened, like plants being created before the sun. We know that doesn't work. Talking snakes and donkeys, burning bushes, seas parting and dudes walking on water and rising from the dead. And what exactly is a firmament anyway? Another thing that's made up. Let's go back to something I mentioned a minute ago, evidence. Well, what is evidence? Loosely defined as the available body of facts and information indicating whether a belief or proposition is true or valid. In order for something to qualify as evidence, it has to be true. It has to correspond to reality, right? And it cannot point to multiple conclusions. For example, assuming law enforcement is looking for a murderer, a piece of evidence cannot indicate that both Mr. Smith and Mr. Jones are both guilty. To take it closer to home, design cannot be evidence for Allah and Yahweh. So what's my evidence that the Christian God doesn't exist? Well, it's the Bible. The Bible is the best evidence that it's all made up. In order to see the Bible as evidence for the Christian God, you need to start there, either with something someone might call a properly basic belief or perhaps a presupposition. Now, to be fair, I'm not suggesting Kenny subscribes to presuppositionalism. In fact, I've heard him say that he repudiates it, which makes me happy because starting with your conclusion is not only lazy but dishonest. Another possibility is for Kennedy to employ the mental gymnastics and apologetics needed to attempt to show he's deducing something that we have no way to confirm, speaking of the supernatural, or try to sell it as abductive. But I'm dying for him to show how something we can't identify, the supernatural, is the best explanation based on the available evidence. Because we can't show supernatural causation at all. No one ever has. Not once. Not ever. I suppose there's another possibility, what William Lane Craig called the immediate experience of God. Now, while I would never try to say that someone who said they had an experience didn't have one, we can't rely on that. To the person who had the experience, it's the best piece of evidence there is. But to an atheist like me, you couldn't offer anything weaker. You might as well say, just look at a sunset and tell me there's no God. But I can't wait to hear his evidence. And I'm looking forward to a great discussion. Thanks so much. All right, with a with a minute to spare, I appreciate that, uh, Michael. I appreciate that opening statement. Um, we're going to now hand it over to Doctor Rhodes. Doctor Rhodes, you have uh, up to twelve minutes. Whatever you don't use, uh, feel free to use it all. But if you don't use it all, we can uh, toss it into the open discussion portion. So, Kenny, whenever you're ready, um, the floor is yours. All right, <clears throat> sounds good. Uh, first of all, uh, man, you've got a lot of questions <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> I appreciate that. I am a person who loves questions. I want to know that what I believe is true and therefore it has to be properly grounded. And my ground would be the laws of logic. I have so much to say, so many thoughts that's popped into my mind. Uh, and I'd kind of like to use the discussion time uh, to focus on some of those particulars. I was trying to listen very carefully, uh, so I didn't even take notes. So Michael, if you would, you know, just uh, bring up some of the stuff uh, in conversation, that would be great. I would like to stick to uh, my order my logical order uh, for the Christian God. So, you know, any attempt to jump down to, you know, issues of inerrancy uh, with scripture for me would be too early in my logical walk to the uh, God of the Bible. Uh, so I would like to stay uh, within the realm of the existence of God. And with that, let me start off by saying that um, Richard Dawkins is probably one of the worst uh, philosophers I've ever heard, and he's even a more worser. <laughs> he is even, as theology is concerned, even more inept in his abilities. Uh, the statement, I just believe in one fewer God, is really, and I don't mean to insult 
but it is probably one of the most naive statements that I've ever heard. When we are talking about Zeus and all of the pantheon, whether it be the Norse or the Greeks, we are talking about created gods. We are talking about those things that are composed. They have parts, they've been put together. And necessarily, the fact that all existent reality is composed necessarily uh, must be grounded in that which is being itself one. So the logical nature of the argument you can't get out of. Uh, when you talk about philosophy, you don't want to go to philosophy, you want to stick with science. Uh, again, uh, anything that we do in science is first grounded in philosophy. Uh, you can't get out of it. And uh, to make a statement, I don't uh, believe in philosophy, is actually to have a philosophy. And as C.S. Lewis once said, um, there's going to be good philosophy or bad philosophy. And it's up to us as Christians to do the good philosophy because everybody engages in philosophy. So the fewer gods argument, and I can demonstrate that as we uh, discuss things. Um, as far as uh, monotheism, uh, there is only one candidate, and that is the creator God. Ontologically speaking, the Jews, Christians, and Muslims, and the ancient Greek philosophers were all referring to this one creator God. There is no other referent, ontologically speaking. So when you move down to the realm of theology, which I think is logical and necessary, you will find that the only uh, reasonable, rational conclusion, the only uh, revelatory, uh, evidentially speaking, God that has communicated with mankind is the one described in the Bible. So when we consider ontology or metaphysics, there is only one God. Any other God that is composed is necessarily not the one God. And this is uh, rational, logical, and ontologically necessary. Um, so uh, I think uh, uh, the last thing I, I will say is that uh, my argument uh, this evening, or what is grounding my thinking, is going to come from St. Thomas Aquinas' first way. And uh, I am going to demonstrate once and for all publicly that those that think that Aquinas' arguments have been destroyed uh, really actually don't understand his arguments. And I will uh, conclude with that. All righty. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rhodes, for that opening statement. Uh, that concludes the opening statements, uh, Michael and Dr. Rhodes. Uh, we've got a great chat already, so I do want to let people know that now is the time where you can start uh, tagging me with your questions for the audience Q&A. Okay, so we're now moving into the open uh, dialogue, as we always do on this channel. We uh, strive to keep it as equally timed as possible, civil and uh, respectful. So we're going to uh, keep it free-flowing and, and organic. And since uh, Dr. Rhodes just finished his opening statement, I do want to pass it over to you, uh, Mike, to kind of start us off in this discussion. Uh, maybe there's a, a couple points you wanted to address and, and a question. But Mike, you are on mute. Just make sure you unmute yourself. And gentlemen, the floor is yours. Um, yeah, I actually, uh, it would be my opinion that since Kenny took so little time that, uh, that he be allowed to kind of come at me first. Um, I took more time that, in it. So I've, I've already spoken way more than he has. So I'd be totally willing to let him start and, and fire away at me. Absolutely. Well, I, I, I would actually take this time for myself and maybe sing a, a couple Johnny Cash tunes couple Metallica tunes and uh, ended off with Metallica. <laughs> What's that? I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I can get behind Metallica. Johnny Cash, not so much. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, he, he was the original bad bud out there. I'm the second. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, a lot to respect about Johnny, but uh, I am an eight, an 80s teenager. So, yeah, I do uh, love my 80s rock. So, um, Michael, um, I would simply uh, just like to ask you if my opening uh, made sense and, and what would you have to say in response to that, whether you would agree or disagree. I think it makes perfect sense for, for a deistic God, but not so much for the God of the Bible. Okay. Yeah. I will definitely uh, address that when, when the time comes. Okay. Um, it, because I want it to be kind of uh, natural that things just Absolutely. kind of flow. And um, this will necessarily go uh, it to two places, you know, Number one, what is the nature of God uh, in reference to what uh, natural theology tells us, uh, as well as what we find through the light of reason in the ancient Greeks and uh, the three major religions that I spoke of. Even Hinduism has this notion of the uh, one creator God, and then the others are known as lesser gods. Uh, but this is kind of interestingly found in many ancient cultures all over the world, this notion of a creator God. Uh, they know him, uh, but they willingly worship these other gods that are created gods. Um, so anyway, I, I, uh, I don't want to take too much time no uh, on this, but just to make it. And then, of course, we'll deal with uh, causality. Um, as well. And I know there's a lot of skepticism over causality these days, uh, but uh, I think that is a matter of uh, a wrong turn historically uh, that has put a lot of uh, our scientists uh, at a place where they are epistemologically blinded to some uh, very important areas concerning causation and the nature of reality. So... And uh, I guess uh, it just kind of responds to that, and let's just get chatting. Yeah, I guess that well, what you said earlier about you know there being all these notions around the world of creator gods, and and that's that's cool. I agree with you what, what you said about the Hindus kind of being uh, Brahman being you know kind of the father, um, and then Vishnu and Ganesh uh, below that. Um, but Zinhite. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but that doesn't mean anything because we're meant to be discussing the, the Christian God, right? So, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that that Christian God is the Creator God, or the only possible monotheistic um, being. Uh, in quotes. Did you just say that the only is. possible one? Yes. Yep. Well, how'd you figure that out? Well, because monotheism is uh, necessarily ontologically uh, the only way to explain the nature of reality and the composition of being itself. The way that we define and make definitions, we look at genus and difference. So if you have two beings that uh, don't have difference in that they essentially exist, they are necessarily one because uh, there is no difference in getting us to genus difference and then species. So necessarily, monotheism is the only possible uh, way that this, quote, being can exist. So can you close that circle for me? Because it, because it, so, so the claim, what I heard was the claim is monotheism is the only way to get there. And then you brought in genus and species, which speaks to biology. And I'm just wondering if you can close that circle for me and tell me how they relate. Um, genus and species is, uh, outdates modern science by a thousand years. These are the categories of Aristotle. Oh, did you go, did you cut out there for a second? No, I just, oh. I just stopped there. I wanted to be very, very brief. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so again, you made the claim that monotheism is the only way to get there. Can you, can you show that somehow? 
uh, I can demonstrate the fact that all that we see in the universe is composed. We call it a universe for a reason, unity and diversity, the one and the many. Uh, as uh, Austin Powers would say, you know, that whole chestnut. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so when we uh, simply look at the composition found in creation, parts have to be put together and parts uh, cannot be the ground of multiplicity. There must be one. This is well known in theoretical thought for 2,500 years, maybe even longer. Uh, that which is composed is dependent upon that which ultimately goes back to that which is not composed and is simple. Okay. So I think it's interesting that you say, and I agree with you, something that is created, sure. But it kind of begs the question that because a creation demands a creator, but you haven't established that yet. Anything that is composed has necessarily been quote unquote created. Okay. So that would violate the first law of thermodynamics though, wouldn't it? Absolutely not. Oh, so, so the, so what is the first law of thermodynamics as you understand it? Uh, that would be uh, energy cannot be created nor destroyed. So then energy could be eternal, no, yeah? Um, possibly, yeah, possibly. Okay. But it has to exist within time, so there you have composition. Okay, but so then how did you determine that there was a creator and that there, and that whatever started it wasn't just an, uh, a natural thing that we hadn't figured out um actually i'm not so uh sure that we should bifurcate reality in the material and the non-material i think that is a cartesian mistake uh so once again historically uh many people are presupposed to think of that bifurcation uh, and that's what has led to the skepticism of, you know, Hume and uh, later philosophers. So uh, I actually uh, don't agree that reality is bifurcated as such. We have no reason to believe it's bifurcated. I, I, I agree with almost everything you said there. We have no reason. We certainly have no reason to believe that there's anything outside of reality. I mean, there's there's the physical stuff, which we can demonstrate, and then there's the... Or, or the material stuff we can demonstrate, and then the immaterial stuff which we can't. Well, the immaterial stuff, would you consider the law of gravity to be immaterial? No. No? Gravity's pretty powerful. Like gra gravity can bend space time. Can you see gravity? No, but you can't see wind either, but you can still measure it. Yeah, and you can see its effects. Yeah, you can measure it, yeah. Yeah, you can, you can de deduce the cause via the effect yeah it, it exists when, within reality you're suggesting that there's something that exists outside of reality i'm saying that there that there is an immaterial aspect to reality which is grounded upon the immaterial again what reality is composed it has to go back to that which is singular that which is the ground of all things has how to did, how, how did you determine there was something immaterial if you didn't if you don't have any way to 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 measure it or test it or anything you can see it by its effects so you're how do we know dark matter exists we see it by well, its I'm, effects. i'm not going to pretend to know anything about dark matter all i no, know is that well what i'm saying is nobody does but we know it exists well i mean physicists talk about it i yeah and i take their word for it yeah right right okay so how do we know it exists i don't know it exists i take their word for it Okay, how do they know it exists? Um, By I'm not seeing sure. its effects. It's invisible, but yet we can see the effects. Okay. So I then... would submit to you that any cause is deducible from its effects, and then the nature of the cause itself can be deduced by the nature of the effects. How did you, but how did you deduce the supernatural? we have no way to demonstrate that at all. Sure we do. Oh. If that which is immaterial reaches into our reality, 
then we know the immaterial exists. If it does, yes. And I would, I would submit that we have evidence for it in the nature of quantum mechanics. Oh, we well, have you're, pure, you're outside of area of expertise again. We have pure prob probability down at the smallest levels of reality. You can't add up an infinite amount of potentials to get an actual. You actually have to have the act of being being given to this world of probabilities and possibilities. And we know that measurement will cause the collapse of the wave function and cause the particle to be, to be actualized. And that is vertical causation. The very nature of reality screams that there must be being itself subsisting in which the probable by participating in the infinite being that is there or infinite existence that is there uh, by participation, that which is possible becomes actual. You can't have it any other way. You can't explain it any other way. Okay. And that's why we know that God is there through the effect. By looking at the nature of the effects, we can follow this need for vertical causation. Well, you had in to jump, about being. jump through a bunch of hoops there, and then all of a sudden, boom, God's there. Um, so how did you... How did you, because it, it sounds like you're doing like a, like a, like a cosmic, like a, like almost like Kalam, right? No, um, no. It, it kind of sounds like that, but so, but my question for you would be, because you said, well, you know, you have to work it back to a being. So now you're smuggling in a being and you're smuggling in this thing that you, that you can't demonstrate at all. Okay. Right? That um, hasn't been demonstrated. Fo fo follow this with me. Existence. Abstractly. Okay. Okay. Um, it can be shared in, in an infinite amount of ways, right? It's infinite. Okay. Okay. So we know that existence conceptually is there. Now, the very definition of God that I am using is this one whose very essence or nature is existence and it must be that way in order to account for that which shares in a, in existence and let me give an example if i've got this world of infinite probabilities and i've got an ocean of existence that in order for any of these potentials to participate in being or coming to be to exist, they have to participate in this infinite ocean of being. That is the only way that anything can come to be. And for the Christian, the monotheistic God, there is only one being who could possibly have within the nature of what it is to be that being is existence itself. And that sure. is the definition of the Christian God. Sure. And for the Christian, that yeah, makes total sense. But you, so you made another claim that there, that this has to be, and I agreed. Rationally for, and for ontologically. Christians, yeah. it has to be. No, it has to be for, for everyone, ontologically doesn't. speaking. It completely Look. doesn't. And I'll tell you why. Okay. So again, the claim was made, it has to be this way. And, and my question to you, which was the question from before, is how did you determine that, that, this, that this primary thing wasn't it, or isn't just an unknown natural cause that we haven't figured out yet? Because the, because the problem is, is that there used to be, and I've, I've mentioned this before with other, uh, other people in other talks, there were so many things that we used to attribute to gods, everything from good crops and bad to thunder and lightning and, and tides raising and everything else like that. And as we learned more stuff, we found that there are natural explanations for these things. Well, it actually wasn't that, you know, it wasn't, uh, you know, it was, you know, air masses and temperature coming together. That's what created the thunder and lightning. And, and so all of these things we used to attribute to a God and we now have a natural explanation for, and, and you can name, Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. But never once, like never once, 
has there been something that we had a natural explanation for that we later went back and said, oh, you know what? That was actually God. It actually wasn't a natural thing. Okay. Um, is it reasonable to have found the instrumental cause or secondary cause for thunder and then by virtue of that to rule out the primary cause? Oh, no, but we know, but in, if you want to use that specific example, we already know what the primary causes are too. Like we can, we can explain all of the aspects of how that thing came to be. Okay, what's the primary cause? Well, I don't personally know what it is, but, but science is laid out. Like what, you know, air mass is coming together, hot and cold, and they come together and it creates you know, the differences in pressure and you get noises and light. Right, via, via these laws, right, which right. would be the natural cause the secondary cause of the instrumental cause, but you what still like must have a primary cause. cause beyond the natural cause. Yes. There must be a cause beyond the natural. Absolutely. And okay, that can be demonstrated uh, many different ways. Uh, I'll do it this way. That which is natural does not have the answer of itself within itself. Uh, existence. There's no such thing as a law of existential inertia we all always see that which comes to be passing away. And so because of that, uh, we know that the very nature of reality, I got distracted there, I forgot what the main point, point was. <laughs> uh, reiterate the question again, I am so sorry. No, no, it's, it's totally fine. Uh, I, I get, I get what, you're, what you're trying to say. Okay. But, but the, what, you're, what we're doing is we're, we're going to the limit of what we know and beyond what we know, I'm comfortable in saying, I don't know. Sure. It, doesn't sound, like you're, it yeah. doesn't sound like you're comfortable saying that. I am comfortable because I actually have the laws of logic to govern me too. Well, we, we, like the, like the, the primary law of non-contradiction, like right. uh, for example, uh, identity, excluded mm -hmm. middle, that is going to inform me of the necessary nature of that which brought about the existence of what we see, including ourselves. Right. So, but what we still don't, what you still haven't been able to get past is the assertion that like, we have to have this, we have to have something beyond the natural. We so have to saying, have for, for the answer of the natural, we have to have that which is being itself. Why? Because it allows that, which is to come to be at the very ground level of reality. All we have is probabilities. You can't have this vertical uh, activity bring about existence. It has to be from the top. It, being itself has to be not only caused, but sustained. And once that uh, cause lifts up, uh, it no longer exists. And this is what you would call a per se causal chain. And I would illustrate it like this. When Eddie Van Halen is playing eruption, and let's pretend there's no recordings, no nothing else. As long as he plays eruption, it exists. When it stops, it no longer exists in its instantiated form, but it does exist as form, pure essence in the agent's mind, that would be Eddie Van Halen. Well, so, it exists in our minds too as memory. Oh, sure. Yeah, but I'm, I'm just talking about it, what is a per se causal chain. Sure. Now, since, since what exists does not have it, the answer for itself, because you can't have eruption play without Eddie Van Halen, uh, quite necessarily, uh, we know that there must be an act of existence comes into this realm of infinite possibilities in order to make something to be. Well, see, that's the claim again, right? There has that, to be, there has to be, there has to be. But what this this is rationally and sure. ontologically speaking. So then please tell me how you determined it can't be a natural cause that we haven't figured out yet. Well, if you want to call an infinite uh, ocean of existence natural, go for it. <laughs> I don't bifurcate reality in that way. I have no reason to bifurcate reality and somehow there's no 
gradual movement from the material to the spiritual realm. And it seems to be that way from the Christian point of view. Angels can interact with the material world. So there's no backwards. There's no ability for those in the lower levels of matter uh, and even the even the Greeks, the, the Gnostics didn't see this bifurcated uh, reality until you got to the Demiurge, of course, and then matter being pure evil. Uh, but there is no reason, even in what we call the analogy of being or the chain of being, there's no reason for us to not uh, or, or to think that there's some gap and that there's this kind of reality and then there's nothing beyond that, that although we can't grab it, uh, for example, they suggest there's, uh, uh, you know, six other spatial dimensions within uh, our universe. We can't grab that. We can't touch it. But we know the mathematics suggests that that is what is going on. Uh, this is a more solid proof. This is actually a mathematical, logical, ontological proof. That which is in the realm of the empirical and natural is not um, certain. And this is how I would approach uh, my Christian faith. Okay, so then, all right, so the, I, I feel like we could be stuck on this and never get anywhere else. Probably, yeah. <laughs> so if you're okay with it, um, let's move on and uh, how, how you got to Jesus. To, to what I, I, I'm sorry? Like, so how'd you get to Jesus? Well, again, uh, if there is an, a monotheistic God, then that means uh, through my looking at the nature of reality, uh, I know, number one, that there is only one of such being. And I look at the nature of reality and I see that, uh, you know, uh, this world seems to be kind of messed up. Um, How do you mean messed up? Uh, evil. 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 Oh, know? okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, but for me to even know evil, I have to have an idea of good. And evil uh, is not a substance. It does have, doesn't have substantial form. It's, it has to inhere in that which is good. So I see that all things are good. This God must be good, even though I may not know why the evil is there. Uh, but you can see the steps that I would take, and I don't want to bore you with the minutia, but once I see through reason what this first cause must be, then I can work and, and see some things about this first cause that is uh, necessarily there as the first cause, as what we would call pure act, no admixture of act and potency. There's no becomingness. Uh, it is all being, it's all existence, this God that is there. So once you look at the nature of reality and then look at what must be for this one, uh, then you can put some things together, uh, see that there's uh, many things about reality um, that don't have their answer in uh, reality itself. It must come from Such that as. which transcends reality love i would say all of the all that we speak of as uh qualitative beauty and uh color just all all the uh properties comes from the essence uh, what a thing is so um seeing these characteristics in us in our nature uh we know that uh, they can't somehow uh, explain themselves. They have to be grounded. Uh, and we can get to the idea that we must have a redeemer. Whoa, because of this fallenness. There. What's that? I'm sorry. How did you get there? The same that way is, Job did. That is an way, Olympic quality long jump, brother. The same way Job did. He had no Bible. He had the nature of reality. And he saw that there's pain, there's sorrow within reality. And, and he could deduce... Even C.S. Lewis had this. This is the argument from desire. Uh, everything that we know of, that we have a desire for in this world has a referent, you know, hunger, uh, sexual desire, you name it. The last one we have is for uh, this idea of existing forever. We don't want to die. Um, so there's just... I don't want to live forever. 
But that's just when uh, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. But when Job looked at the nature of reality and knowing fallenness and suffering, it's like, but yet he saw good. He could deduce and say, wow, this, there must be a redeemer for me. And not only that, there must be a resurrection of even my own self. Uh oh, I thought I put this on silent. It's okay. My phone went off first this time. So I'm going to continue. You get a free pass. Yeah. Sorry for, sorry about that one. You know, that's going to throw me off now because of my ADD. But uh, anyway, so knowing that you needed a redeemer, uh, th this is reasonable. This is rational uh, to approach life with. Uh, to be an atheist is the most irrational position, no offense, that one could ever hold to. Uh, it, it, it has uh, unrealistic expectations about evidence and can you tell me what one of my unrealistic expectations of evidence is? Uh, that God would be subject to the empirical method, the scientific method. Um, I don't necessarily think that that's that that's I don't necessarily think that that's the case. Um, he wouldn't have to be subject to the scientific method if he just showed up. Well, he did. Well, so you believe. But well, anyway, uh, I if you showed up 10 years ago or even right now, there would be a time where those would have to believe the testimony. You know, let's say he showed up to you and, and it could be confirmed. Um, all, all that the atheists say, God has already done. He's already promised to take evil and suffering and, and not destroy it, but actually conquer it through our battle uh, with the struggle so that we become even a, a better class of moral being than we could attain to without that struggle. In the same way, it takes practice to be a good musician, takes that struggle to be a weightlifter. Um, that's just the way things are. We need that battle with suffering and pain and evil to develop some things in us that uh, couldn't be there without it. I find it really interesting how you've kind of tiptoed tip through the tulips to go from there has to be this thing, and then I ask you how you got to Jesus, and you and you. I mean, I probably got off 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 course a bit there. Yeah, like there's just <laughs> like, I mean, it's just tacked on assumption after assumption after question begging after question begging to okay. now I need a redeemer. W and would you point one out and, and and let me see if I can give you a sufficient answer? Sorry, say that again. W what would be uh, question begging that I just did uh, that you could point out and then ask me. Well, so what you said was, you know, is that we, so for instance, we, uh, so there, there's a create. So you first, you said creation, creation okay. demand creator, right? So okay. that, that's taking okay. the question that the God, that, that a creator exists in the first place. And then you got all the way to, so now we have to have a redeemer. Okay. Well, so let me, sense. let's start at the first one then sure. if I could, before I forget. <laughs> um, when I see that reality where, you know, what we're looking at, that it is made of parts, mm -hmm. it has to be composed. So uh, if you want to say there is a composition and there's a, there's a need for a composer, you know, we, I don't have to call it creation. Uh, but I do know that uh, with parts and holes, uh, holes are dependent upon the parts. From one point of view, there's also uh, the ontological point of view where the whole uh, is ontologically prior to the parts in one aspect because uh, it is the whole that determines the arrangement of the parts. And it actually, that whole is actually when the uh, essence or form uh, comes to be through the act of composition. So uh, this is all based on the law of non-contradiction. And I'm right there with you. And, and it, and all sounds groovy until I say, well, what if we just call it reality instead? Go ahead. Does it still have the properties and attributes that must what be does reality demand. If creation demands a uh, creator, what does reality demand? Uh, an actualizer. Why? Because that, which is potency cannot come to be on its own. Prove it. Um, scientific method, causation is all about, scientific method is all about discovery sure. cause, and, and discovering I'm fine. causes. I'm so fine there. With all of that. 
but but we still and and again this is my fault that i dragged us back to this i apologize but we still can't you know like you can say you know causation all that other stuff sure cool but but we but you have been able to establish that it's just that it isn't an unknown natural cause that we haven't figured out yet the, an, an unknown natural cause that we haven't everything we've discovered has been natural we've never discovered anything supernatural okay let me show you how silly that statement is but what, what you're asking is for something supernatural what you're asking for is to um account for only efficient causation there, there are other causes out there there is uh, the form or what might we might say the concept uh the blueprints uh there's the final cause the cause of causes that uh, for which an agent acts so there's more than one type of causation and i think uh for you to say natural cause I think you're saying efficient cause uh, and within efficient causality, you can have instrumental causes. I, 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 I say this gently, but I, I would suggest that maybe you and most atheists don't understand the nature of causation. And so maybe that's why what I'm saying is not uh, as evident to you as it might be for me. And I'm not saying I, you know, smarter or anything like that. I'm just saying I have looked into causation. So what do you understand about the nature of causation that would lead you to say, uh, you know, we can find a natural cause. Uh, all you're going to find is a secondary cause, which we would say are the laws of nature. And even those laws of nature demand a mind behind it because they're consistent. Why How does it always end the way it ends. Why does an acorn always become an oak? That there is uh, some direction there. I know uh, Dawkins likes to talk about biology as a study of those that have apparent design, and so that apparent design they like to call teleonomic versus uh, teleologic. Actually, they're distinguishing be between primary causation, secondary causation, or what you might call a proximate cause. Uh, versus the distal cause when we're talking about the nature of final causation. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm convinced now that uh, it's opened up to me that because causation has not been looked into, that's why it seems so uh, undiscoverable, maybe. So well, is from it, the atheist point of view, I, I would say. Uh, okay. Um, so to break it down, it's like super duper simple language. Every, does every cause, when you take it back as far as you want to go back, have to have a cause -er? Uh There are things that we would say uh, have it. They, they have the ability to cause in the nature of what they are. Uh, for example, um, you know, sometimes you don't have to have a black eye in order to give a black eye. Uh, so um, in that sense, um, I don't I just have to have the power or the ability to bring something um, to pass. When we look at uh, the nature of reality and, and beings, uh, we, we see that God has actually endowed them with some agency. Uh, there are still secondary causes. They're not the. Uh, where the chain stops, uh, they necessarily are grounded in this per, per se causal act. Uh, and I would say it like this, the uh, per accidents, uh, what would be instrumental causes, secondary causes, uh, the per accidents necessarily implies the per se, meaning that which has something uh, within its nature and can give it. Okay. Why can't that be natural? Uh, it, it is natural sometimes. 
but you can't go when when you look at the ground of it you necessarily go back to that which is immaterial no you do i don't well and that's why i'm right and you're wrong sorry for the zinger i, I couldn't no, it, it's, it. it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> let let it be shown that that uh, the christian was the first one to make it personal like that um uh, no it's it's fine I'm just i'll take it around. i'll take I'm just it. Messing around. so let's try to move forward so I've heard you say that you don't, um, you know, that you repudiate presuppositionalism, mm -hmm. um, which I, which I, which does make me happy. Um, what is your, what's your final authority? My final authority? Yes. As a uh, Christian, what's your I final would, authority? I would say it's absolutely uh, God himself. Now, how do I get there? If you're interested, I can share it with you. But uh, God is, is my authority okay. okay god you're fine okay um so not not the bible uh now when you speak of his word of course his word uh is my authority but if you're going to make a dis you have to make a necessary distinction between the instantiation of that word uh versus its existence and this is what an essence is. It's real conceptually. There's a real conceptual conceptualization present there. Uh, and it has to be instantiated. Uh, and that's where multiplicity comes in. So you have singleness, grounds, everything else. You print Bibles up, etc. Uh, but anyway, I just did that just to illustrate yes. the, the coherence of everything. Um, so, you know, you, you probably want to point out some maybe some issues with scripture, transmission errors, uh, things of that nature. And that would not disturb me in the slightest uh, because uh, the Christian belief is that uh, the, the, the way that God gave it to say the apostle Paul and in his inscripturating it, that is where the infallibility and the inerrancy resides. It doesn't reside in copies. Oh, so the, so the Bible that you read every day has, has things that are wrong in it? Uh, yeah, it can have things that are wrong. It's a translation for one. How did you figure out which, which parts of it were wrong? And which well, I, I, learned, wrong? I learned Greek and Hebrew. That's, that's what I did. Oh, okay. So yeah. did the did the and and you're right. I do want to go to some biblical stuff. So in Joshua, where where it says the sun stood still in the sky, you think that really happened? Yeah, absolutely. Even it's still, like totally physically impossible. Yeah, it, it was. It's a light refraction uh, situation, not a stopping of the movements of the heavenly bodies. So the Bible says the sun stood still in the sky. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we would call that uh, phenomenological language. Oh, okay. You should hook up with a guy in, who's in the chat right now, CJ Cox, because he would argue the sun absolutely stood still in the sky. I've asked him that question, in fact. Um, but so that that's interesting. Um, wow, that's. I think you're the first Christian I've ever spoken to that hasn't said that the by that the word of God is their final authority. I find that interesting. Um, why don't you ask me something else? Um, you know, I, 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 I'm not so interested in grilling you. I, I, I think just a, a conversation, you know, because I'm not trying to get you, you know, or anything like that or stump you. No, I, I don't um, think that that's the case. But I mean, you can say. Yeah. Actually, sure. you know, if you don't mind, because, you know, I am feeling under the weather, I would like to go to questions from the audience because uh, I don't think I can handle two hours. <laughs> so. That's uh, that. That's fine. If uh, yeah. it looks like now, um, I just have a, a, a little uh, a little snippet of a of a finishing bit that I that sure I do. absolutely yeah. Um, but uh, looks like you should say it because I don't know where her standing is. <laughs> oh, he's in, I'm sure he's in the background. Yeah, uh, I'm sure he was in the background writing down all the questions that he has for you. I'm sure I have no questions from the audience this time. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, but yeah, um, Donnie, are you there? He probably stepped away. Okay, so, well, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in and say, uh, okay, sure. we've reached the time for closing statements. Uh, yada yada yada. Michael, you're first. 
Wow. Uh, I know Donnie will love uh, you taking over his channel. He, <laughs> he usually only likes it when I do it. Hey, so, let's you and I do it. We'll split the cash. Oh, that, that's good. Get some of that big Christian money. Absolutely. Uh, okay. Big money in Christian business. Yeah. So, uh, okay, sure. Well, um, I guess the, I, I, I hope the questions are numerous. Uh, okay, so I want to thank everyone for tuning in. Uh, and I must admit, I may take that back after I look at the live chat afterwards. Um, or hear some of the upcoming questions, which I'm sure will be equally numbered between Kenny and myself. Um, well, no conversions tonight. And I suppose no deconversions either, either and that's okay. If I gave even one person pause uh, to think for just a moment or ask questions, I'm happy with that. There's no harm in questioning for sure. Um, and I don't have the power to deconvert anyone. Uh, I can plant a seed, nothing more. Um, now, what else did we see? No ad homes, no dumpster, dumpster fires. Uh, thanks to Donnie for offering to, uh, uh, for his platform to continue to elevate the conversation. Guys, uh, I'm, I'm an atheist. I'm not evil. I'm not demon possession. I don't dine on babies. Um, there are fundamental disagreements, sure. Uh, but we can still be the amazing people that all of our dogs think we are. But not cats, because cats just think we're slaves. And I often wonder what the pythons I keep uh, think. I don't know, but I am curious. Um, let's keep the conversation going. Uh, I think as long as we're talking, we're not fighting. I'd offer up our little bitty podcast to anyone and everyone, uh, like Donnie, who has agreed to come on soon. So that'll that'll be fun. Um, now, I do have to say, in, in offering up the platform to quote unquote anyone and everyone, um, anyone who knows me knows that there are a couple of exceptions to my anyone rule. And if you're watching, no, not you. Uh, now, Donnie, crucify me with some questions. Thanks. All right. Well, that there's uh, that handsome feller. <laughs> I uh, I still had 12 minutes left on the clock, so I thought I had enough time yeah. to go upstairs and get myself a drink. But uh, you guys pulled a fast one on me. Well, so. you know, uh, I I I definitely won't have the uh, wherewithal to go, you know, the whole uh, two hours for sure, because uh, just no been worries. physically no rough. We've got some questions that we'll get through. Uh, to be fair, uh, Michael just did his um, closing statement. Therefore, uh, Kenny, did you want a couple minutes to wrap up your thoughts and your points, or do you want to go just right into the questions? Uh, I'll go ahead and uh, wrap it up here. Um, I want to just uh, say thank you there to Michael. And uh, he doesn't know this, but I'm sure that he will find this uh, of interest and encouraging. Uh, but uh, there's a guy by the name of Gordon Kennedy that I have played music with for 30 years, uh, cut uh, some, uh, cut a, a record, uh, played jazz with him and rock and all kinds of stuff, a top for him because he owns a music uh, teaching school. Uh, he is an atheist, and uh, we have already talked about and planned to start doing some programs together uh, to demonstrate how two friends who really actually love each other uh, like brothers, probably more than brothers. Uh, uh, I have kissed him on the cheek, but uh, I digress there. Um, we want to just demonstrate how you can get passionate, um, care for one another deeply, disagree. Uh, so anyway, um, that's in the plans and in the works, uh, because I have a desire to demonstrate that atheists are not evil. They're not reprobates. Um, I do believe that you can truly have questions and have a season of total doubt and go into atheism. Uh, but I do think that there may be a time in that season and only the individual, uh, would know. Uh, when that season of true questioning becomes a season of wanting to their wanting for there not to be a God, wanting to move in that direction, and then it re becomes rebellion. So, uh, so anyway, I I just want to demonstrate um, that we should be humans uh, when we approach one another, and that is our common ground, our humanity. So. 
All right. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, very engaging discussion, uh, Michael and Kenny. I enjoyed the informal nature of it. So that being said, uh, before we get into these questions, though, for anybody new uh, in the audience, if you kind of just got here, got here uh, in the middle of the debate, a couple reminders. We do have some uh, epic debates for you guys in the future. Um, October 12th, is God one or three divine persons? Matt Slick versus Dr. Shabir Ali. This one's definitely going to break the internet. It's going to be awesome. I'm pumped for it. So make sure you are here for that event. We've also got uh, in about five days, we've got CJ Cox and Dr. Randall Rouser debating the question, did God command the slaughter of the Canaanites? Then we've also got the main event, September 30th, uh, C.J. Cox versus Kent Hoven on end times theology, pre-tribulation rapture versus post-tribulation rapture. Also, at the very beginning of the month in October, we've got Nephilim Free and Skyo debating the age of the earth, young or old. So that's certainly going to be an epic, epic debate. Uh, plenty more as well, guys. Just make sure you're checking, please, the upcoming live stream section. And I'm doing my best to... Uh, update the event section on our uh, official official website. So that being said, let's get right into the questions, gentlemen. Um, as we usually do, and I think you guys know, whoever the question is for gets the last word. But let's say the question's for Michael. Uh, Kenny can have a chance to uh, give his thoughts as well, but we'll just give Michael the last word. So first question that came in all the way near the beginning was from the synagogue. Question is for you, Michael. Uh, he's coming at you, but he's allowed to. You guys have had a couple debates before, so <laughs> we'll have to get uh, the big round three soon. So I like CJ. <laughs> so his question is, what are your main reasons for not finding arguments from fulfilled prophecy convincing? Oh, that's a sneaky question. <laughs> so C CJ and I had a little Twitter message back and forth and I told him that, you know, that that wasn't my my strong suit. Um, the, the only one that I, the only one that I'm, even partially uh, equipped to try to argue is um, Tyre, which I've heard him debate with with other people as well. Um, and yeah, I, I don't uh, I I don't see the I I don't see the prophecies fulfilled. I guess the same way uh, other people do. But I will say to anyone who hasn't watched um, any of his uh, uh, any of his uh, talks on this, CJ did a couple of episodes not too long ago on how like on fulfilled uh, prophecy so go find his channel and uh, and check those out because they're good i appreciate that response michael and i appreciate the question cj uh dr rhodes you are on mute if there was a couple points or anything you wanted to add to that go ahead uh i would just uh, say that i i do believe uh that is a strong evidence for the fact that the bible came from a transcendent source so predictive prophecy is uh something i would hold to absolutely all right i appreciate that kenny uh michael final word or move on to the next i'm not going to give cj any more our time <laughs> let's move on <laughs> to the next one. <laughs> okay here we go here we go we've got next question comes in from gavin hurleyman this question is for both i appreciate the question gavin his question is science confirms that the laws of physics existed before the universe began what's the ontology of these laws since the question is for both whoever would like to start uh, i i guess i'll start with that uh, i would have to kind of get some clarification uh, but uh, for me i would simply say that the laws of physics uh, they didn't uh, come before the universe. They came into being at T equals zero with the universe, 14 or 13.789, I think, years ago. Um, so, man, I forgot what I was going to say. Uh, anyway, I'll just say, uh, say that. <laughs> uh, they, they, they came into to existence and God 
uh, even uh, Penrose, uh, Roger Penrose says that the, uh, uh, the fine tuning there of the initial conditions of the Big Bang is something to 10 to the 10 to the 123, I believe. So astronomical uh, fine tuning in all the parameters of the Big Bang. So quite naturally, uh, when God gave it the act of existence or the act of being or what we call the actus ascendi, uh, that's when it came into existence at T equals zero. And it was uh, tuned up to uh, have all the laws and parameters work out, even through, you know, the origin of life and speciation. Now, I don't necessarily believe that. Uh, but I have to say that for, you know, intellectual honesty, uh, there is no problem with God preloading the universe at the Big Bang. Um, so uh, anyway, I, I just say that because uh, intellectually, I must be honest in, in making the statements that I said. So, All right. I appreciate that response, uh, Dr. Rhodes. Michael, go ahead. Yeah. Um, first of all, I appreciate you saying the Earth is um, is measured in uh, the age of the universe is measured in billions of years, not thousands of years, because thousands of years is silly. Um, but that's a whole nother discussion. And I'm sure there's people in the chat that are trying to crawl through their computers right now. Hey, uh, don't make me debate you right now, Michael. <laughs> um, so, but uh, but also, I think uh, I would agree with with Ken. We'd have a point of agreement here in that my understanding. I'm not a scientist. I only play one on TV. Um, but my understanding is that uh, that that the laws that we experience did come into uh, come into effect at the beginning of uh, of our universe. Um, I, I believe that that is uh, correct. Um, but I think it's interesting with the the fine tuning thing because one of the things that I heard. Um, uh, physicist uh, Sean Carroll mentioned in one of his talks was that, you know, like the, the way the, the, the way the supposed dials are all tuned for our universe is what, why we have ours, but you could turn tune every one of those dials a little bit differently. And we may not have us, but there may be another universe. Um, so we, we can't say that nothing would exist, but we may not have the universe we currently have. All right. Well, I appreciate the answer. Uh, the answer is from the both of you. So let's jump right to the next question. This one comes in from Landon Freeman. I appreciate the question, Landon. Question for Michael. What evidence would make you become more of an agnostic and or a theist? Um, that's a really good question. I've thought about this a lot. So uh, just I'm not sure that I ever shared this uh, on, on your show, Donnie, but I, I wasn't always a heathen. Um, I was raised uh, I was raised a Christian. Um so, and I believe that I went through a period of agnosticism where I was truly like, I, where I was truly the quote unquote fence sitter, didn't know. Um, so I'm not sure what would take me back to not being sure. Um, but what it would take to make me a theist, um, that's a really good question. And I'm not trying to dodge it, but, I, but I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. And I'm not sure what it would take to convince me. And there are probably people that are rolling their eyes right now, but that's the most honest answer I can give you. I mean, that's, that's all we're asking for is a nice, honest answer, Michael. So I appreciate it. So next question comes you in. Know, from you know, I'd like to answer that. And I would say right. that for me to become an atheist, uh, it would have to be demonstrated to my satisfaction that um, I actually don't exist. That's the evidence I would uh, accept. Well, I appreciate uh, your input there, Kenny. Um, I must have went there. over everybody's head. Sorry. <laughs> Michael, prove right now that Kenny doesn't exist. But uh, realistically. Rewind it back and, and, and meditate on the, the profundity <laughs> of my sillinesses. <laughs> you're, you're keeping it fun. You're keeping it fun, Kenny. So next question comes in from what's the takeaway? Thanks for your question. Uh, question for Michael. He asks, how would you argue against someone who told you that they merely lacked a belief in the non-existence of God? That sounds like a silly kind of like word tricky thing. 
lacked a belief in the non-existent. So is he saying- I would rebuke them for a double negative. Yeah, that they would be then ag agnostic then, or I, I'm not 100% sure. But I, so it's funny because- I, I, I played around a lot and I kind of poked, I kind of poked, you know, some Christians in the eye saying, you know, you guys argue about stuff all the time, but listen, atheists are not immune to arguing about stuff. Um, people in our community, we can't even agree on what the word atheist means. You know, we bicker over, Oh, it's lack of belief. No, it's saying gods don't exist. So we bicker about silly stuff too. Um, but uh, what, what I try to do is I, I let people, I'm, I don't like to assign labels to people. I'll ask people what they believe and how they how they identify, and then I'll address them accordingly. I'm not going to try to say, well, what you actually believe is this, or what you actually are is that, because um, I think that's I think that's dishonest. Like, who are you to tell people what they are? Um, I'm I'm sure I'm sure not a Christian listening to this would would enjoy a conversation where where you exchanged beliefs and they looked at you and said, well, you're not a Christian, right? So. All right. I appreciate that. Mike, uh, Kenny, if you had anything uh, to add, go ahead. Uh, what's the question again? I, I'm, I'm sorry. That's okay. That's okay. Michael well, said something that got me thinking he's about playing video <laughs> games. He's playing video games. <laughs> I'm napping. <laughs> no worries. Let's move on to the next one. So this one comes in from honesty angel question for Michael. Do you believe things that cannot now nor ever will be explained have happened and do happen? Um, I would say on a large scale throughout the universe. Yeah. Like I'm sure there's all kinds of stuff that's happened, um, during the quote unquote evolution of, uh, of, of our universe, um, that we can't explain. We have no idea. We also have no idea what prebiotic earth was like. Um, so yeah, I think there's, there's stuff we can't explain. All and right, I think, I and I think sometimes saying, like I said before, I think sometimes saying, I don't know is the most honest thing you can say. Absolutely. Uh, Kenny, any, anything you wanted to add, my good man? Oh, well, I, I think I could tell you what the prebiotic earth was like because it wouldn't have any biotics because it'd be prebiotics. <laughs> wah, wah. <laughs> Dad joke. <laughs> Never a bad joke from you, Kenny. <laughs> Okay, let's get to the next question. Comes in from Sam Jenkins. I appreciate your question, Sam. Question for Michael. Michael, you've been on the hot seat all night, so I. This is not fair. I was told there would be equal questions. <laughs> Any questions for Kenny? Uh, last minute questions for Kenny. Uh, Toss them in right now, guys. We're making I'll, up I'll for what happened screen. to me on Modern Day Debate. So <laughs> that could be it. Fair. That could be it. Um, so the question, Michael, is: What would it take to convince you of one? a creator being real and two, the Bible is the word of God and three, Jesus actually being God incarnate to take the sin of the world. I feel like I kind of addressed this a, a couple minutes ago. Saying yeah, it is not, a similar, not hundred percent sure, but, but I, I do mean, and I don't mean this at all tongue in cheek. Um, the Bible is one of the biggest reasons I believe it's, that is not true. Kenny, those might be some fighting words. You want to add anything to that? <laughs> oh, I'd just like to point out once again why I'm right and he's wrong. Right. <laughs> we can move on. <laughs> All right. Well, you know what? That uh, I, I didn't see any last minute. That, that would open up a ton of stuff that I, I, you know, maybe I could address it another time. But yeah. Hey, we can do round two, man, whenever. Absolutely. Sure. Just yeah. say maybe uh, yeah. that'll open up some stuff. I'd be glad to. Say. Oh, and I would say thank you, Michael. Uh, I'm assuming since it looked like you were reading your closing statement that you assumed that, uh, or I should say, you had the faith that looking at the way I conduct myself with people, that we would have a cordial um, dialogue, and I just thank you for that. Well, you know what? Honestly, I based that. Um, this is actually the first closing that I've ever actually written for anything. And um, full disclosure, I wrote it based on previous discussions I've seen you have. And I don't know that I've seen you involved in a dumpster fire. So I thought it reasonable to assume that you'd be decent in this. I appreciate that. I really do. 
one of these days we'll find um, Kenny an interlocutor that uh, results in a dumpster fire. <laughs> so actually, there is a question here for you, Kenny. Just came in from Redefine Living. Exactly. Question for Kenny. Can the God who imposes, governs, and sustains the laws of nature, including the laws of physics, temporarily suspend them for Joshua's long day? Theoretically, yes. But as my theological mentor, Dr. John C. Whitcomb of the Genesis Flood uh, book, he would say that we necessarily must presuppose an economy of miracles that God is going to, uh, because of even the nature of miracles, God is going to be, uh, even following Occam's razor, uh, he's going to be very particular about the miracles that he would do, uh, because if he suspends the laws of nature constantly, you know, then why did he create those laws in the first place? And then just all of a sudden to constantly uh, suspend them, you have God involved in nonsense. Um, so, and that's why I don't think it's best to claim, you know, a, a change in the laws of physics to account for you know, a young earth, uh, I, I, I think it uh, violates some very important theological uh, issues, including um, immutability. So anyway. All right. I appreciate that. Uh, one last question. This one's for you again. Uh, Kenny uh, comes in from Landon Freeman. What is the best evidence for God's existence? Um, Kenny, what's one of your favorite uh, arguments? I would for, say... Uh, and um, I, I, I won't unpack it because I, I want to make sure that um, when I unpack it, and I certainly can in the future, but the fact that I am, little i, little a, little m, necessarily implies that there is the I am, the capital I, capital A, capital M. That would be grounded simply upon the law of non-contradiction and identity, and I can demonstrate that. But I think there are other equals to that as well. The essence, existence, composition argument as well, I believe, uh, is very good. So, All right, I appreciate that. Uh, Michael, we'll give you the opportunity to respond if you'd like. Um. I, I don't think I can respond fairly without blowing something up. So maybe we'll just, maybe we'll just save that for round two. Yeah. Anything uh, that'll result in, in some blowing up, we'll save for the. Uh, it's going to blow up because he'll have to deny the law of non-contradiction to get out of its implications. So I can see why he thinks it's going to blow up. <laughs> uh, just, just poking at you there, man. I, it's totally fine. Yeah. You're going to take that, Mike? You're going to take that? Yeah, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, Making it on the chin. Yeah. He's, he's coming. Yeah. Like you said before, he's coming down off some meds and stuff like that. I'm going to take it easy. You, you know, actually, I'm kind of making fun of uh, a presuppositionalism in an indirect way by asserting yeah, I'm right, you're wrong. Yeah. 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 So that's, it's, that's you know, actually. I, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, it's funny. The precept argument is 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 interesting. Um, I had a really long. Sorry, not to to branch off into something too much here, but um, Saitem Brugenkate, who's a fellow Canadian, um, he came on the podcast and he actually sat about three feet from where I'm sitting right now. He actually came in studio into my house, and uh, we sat there and had a great had a great conversation. And it, it's but I've always found precept really. In just so completely dishonest. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm glad that you had said before that you repudiate it. So yeah, you you if anybody asks me, there's always a principle behind my jokes, you know, and why I'll do and repeat things. So 
And a follow-up question from Redefine Living, Kenny. He's coming at you. He's coming at you. Okay. So uh, his question is, why do you say he would be suspending the laws of nature constantly when this would have been one specific miracle? Uh, if, if you would have to account for all of the miracles in the Bible um, and, you know, what it would take uh you know in the history of a non big bang non uh you know pre laws governing it um you would it would it just wouldn't make any sense to even violate um his principles uh which he laid down at the beginning constantly so if you're going to say that's the way he did it for joshua's day then that's the way you're going to have to say all kinds of other stuff but when god's doing miracles or whatever usually uh, you'll find miracles of providence being the most uh you know having the greatest number of that, that would be a type of miracle what dr wickham would call the type b miracle and type A would be even, even more rare. Um, so, anyway, that's why I say, um, you know, to suspend the laws of physics, that's going to be a type A miracle, and he could do it through a type B miracle easy enough, which is what he does in scripture most of the time. And then it would be simply a light refractive, um, quote unquote, miracle through providence and the laws of physics i there's no need to stop everything so all right um we're gonna end with this question here uh keep it balanced this final question comes in for you michael do you instinctively this comes in from dan straight i appreciate the question do you instinctively or innately feel that human life has value and a transcendent purpose do you think it makes sense to undermine that with atheism. Wow, I certainly don't think that atheism un undermines that. Um, I, I do, I do believe uh, that uh, that life has value. Um, I think you'd have to define transcendent um, for me to offer an opinion on that. But, but I absolutely believe that life has value. And if anything, um, I don't. This isn't the trial run, right? I'm, I'm not. I have nothing to die for. I only get so many spins around the sun and then it's all over. Um, so if anything, I would, I would maybe argue that to, to the, the atheist, to the non-believer or the unbeliever, whatever you want to label, you want to put on it. Um, life has more value because it's, because it's not the pregame. All right. I appreciate that. Um, I think that is a very good answer. I had not thought of it that way, but yeah. And I say that because of the fact that some Christians treat this life as unimportant. And so, you know, and we even see that in scripture, they just kind of quit everything and decided, Hey, we're just going to wait for Jesus to come back. And uh, I think uh, the atheists, uh, in that sense, would do, as Scripture says, redeem the time for the days are evil, because every day is going to be precious if you don't have any more coming. I, I think that very good answer, and I had never thought about it until you mentioned it. But Thanks. There you go. It's nice to see um, that we're going to end this debate with you guys uh agreeing and uh, getting along so nicely. So that being said, uh, we can't thanks. do that. Like we've got to flip each other off before you turn the cameras off. Come on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We got to give you guys something to disagree. I've about. been flipping you off the whole time. So <laughs> uh, you've, been playing, you've been playing video games. Don't lie. <laughs> I think it's the video games. Yeah. Is, is the real reason why uh, yeah. Dr. Rhodes didn't want to go on camera tonight. I'm yeah. <laughs> just kidding. So that being said, uh, that concludes the debate, guys. I apologize uh, in the um, in the chat if we did miss your question. I think there is a couple I missed, but I apologize. Um, 
So, gentlemen, thank you for uh, giving us your time for tonight's debate. Uh, Kenny, especially, because uh, I know you're not feeling well. You are in our prayers, of course, hoping for a speedy recovery. Thank I want to give yeah. you guys... Um, I want to give you guys a uh, final uh, word or, or final um, some final thoughts in terms of of the debate or if you just want to advertise your channels, anything like that. I uh, just want to give you guys the floor for some final words. Uh, we can start with you, Michael. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah. So, um, uh, Donnie, if you wouldn't mind just chucking in my maybe my email into the uh, into the live chat. Uh, I meant what I said about uh, open invitation with a couple of exceptions. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I like having these conversations and I, I welcome more of them. And so you can feel free to reach out if you don't want to do it on the podcast, we can start an email chain back and forth. Um, but yeah, let's, let's continue to, to elevate the conversation and kudos again to, to Donnie for, for keeping for, for keeping it elevated um, and for, and for, you know, allowing, uh, uh, you know, a heathen into his, uh, into his den. <laughs> I appreciate that. I appreciate those, uh, those kind words. Always a pleasure. And, and you're always welcome on uh, Mike. We'll get you some more, some more epic debates. I've got some uh, possible interlocutors in mind. So we're going to have cool. some fun. We're going to have some fun. Uh, Kenny, final words, final thoughts before we shut her down. Uh, since I thought you were going to say you were going to leave us with a parting gift, uh, <laughs> and now I'm angry, I'm not saying nothing. <laughs> totally understandable, Kenny. Totally understandable. Um, so, I think that's the thing is, like, as Canadians, are we expected to just give gifts all the time? I think so. I think so. Uh, Kenny, I'm going to send you over a Tim Hortons coffee. There you go. Uh, us Canadians are famous for those. So hopefully you are a, uh, a coffee drinker. <laughs> yes, I, I actually am a coffee drinker. I drink a lot more. I drink other substances, but I do drink coffee. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I am a coffee drinker. Love my coffee. <laughs> All right. Well, that being said, guys, thanks for, uh, for everybody who uh, tuned in. Um, for today's epic debate tomorrow, we've got, uh, we're going to be back at six for a show with, uh, professor David McQueen. Please check the upcoming live streams, uh, section. We're also going to be back here. Um, I believe it's, uh, the 26th for, um, a debate. There we go. Wrong one, CJ. I appreciate it. Uh, you just got so many debates that I'm clicking the wrong one. So uh, did God command the slaughter of the Canaanite? So we'll see you then for that, uh, that epic debate. Anyways, everybody, thanks again, Mike. Thanks again, uh, Kenny, for this uh, epic, epic debate. Yeah, glad uh, to be God here. Bless. Thank you for asking for sure. Thank you. Yep. I appreciate yep. it. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you to everybody in the, in the chat. Thanks for the uh, last minute super chats that came in. Uh, shout out to Alec. I appreciate the support. You guys are the life and blood of this channel. You guys are keeping us going strong. So God bless you. And standing for truth is out. Mm -hmm.